Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Welcome to this ongoing series, Talking Dance, sponsored by the Steps Beyond Foundation. I am Alan Manneker, Foundation Board Chair, and I'll be your host and interviewer. This series continues to present an exciting lineup of dance artists who will be sharing their stories and insights with you. They range from across the dance spectrum. The full lineup and information can be found at stepsbeyond, that's one word, dot org. There's also a place there to make a suggested donation, should you be so inclined. And we do hope you will be, so that we can continue to bring quality programming. We ask you please to donate if you are able. Also, please note that you may enter your comments and questions in the chat, and we'll make every effort to answer all questions asked. And if you would like to let us know where in the world you're listening in from, we would love to know. Tonight, we have a very special interview. And I'm gonna share my screen here. As part of our Champions of Blacks in Dance, the choreographer, dancer, and teacher, Sidra Bell. Sidra Bell holds a BA in history from Yale University and an MFA in choreography from Purchase College Conservatory of Dance. She is currently a master lecturer at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and a recent artist in residence at Harvard University. She has received many commissions from institutions and companies internationally and created over 100 new works for companies worldwide. She is the first black woman ever to create a new work for New York City Ballet in October, 2020. Her company founded in 2021 is Sidra Bell Dance New York. And trust me when I tell you that that was a very abbreviated bio. So please welcome Sidra. Hello, Sidra. Hello, so nice to be here with you. So nice to be here with you as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And so I'm gonna start off at the beginning. I know you're one of those rare creatures, a native New Yorker. Yes. And you were you grew up in the Inwood section of Manhattan, yeah? Born and raised. I was born at Lenox Hill Hospital. My mom was from Brooklyn. That's Bedford Stuyvesant area of Brooklyn. And she grew up in a really uh, wonderful household with many brothers and sisters. And my dad is from the Bronx. Um, and they, they actually met through music at New York College of Music. Wow. And set forth on, you know, just a long relationship of collaborating and um, eventually had me in the late 1970s and I just kind of fell into their world of art making and they were also educators. So my upbringing was highly influential in, in everything that I'm doing now. And they're still really involved in, in what I'm doing both as artistic advisors and collaborators in my work as a dance maker. Wow. So your family hits Brooklyn, Bronx and Manhattan. Yes. You've only got Queens and Staten Island left and then you got the whole city covered. Yes, I have extended family too all over the place. Uh -huh. um, so I feel like New York is mine. <laughs> New York is your playground. Yes, so when, when you were growing up, did you go to performances regularly? I did. Uh, my brothers and sisters and I, I'm the youngest of four. And we all talk about how our parents brought us to everything. We you know we're at the Met, at Lincoln Center, at BAM. Um, you know, a myriad of kinds of performances too, from choral, you know, being at Carnegie Hall and to ballet performances. My dad actually had a deep appreciation of ballet dance from being an artist in Saratoga. Um, and so he had seen city ballet a lot um, over the years. And, you know, I think he really loved dance and that was sort of part of both of my parents taking me into that world, but we saw everything, jazz, um, and in addition to that, my parents were also active performers. So we would also be brought along to gigs and studio sessions. And I have lots of photos of me and my siblings just kind of, you know, sitting on the couch in a studio in downtown Chelsea, you know, just listening to our parents make music. So it was a very unique upbringing. Fantastic. Do you remember the first dance performance you saw? 
or one, one of, of the remember, first one of the first um i remember being taken to see Petrushka, um and having a really strange reaction to it actually because i'd never seen something so modern right. um, at that point i had already been training in ballet at dance theater Harlem, and so it was really different for me but that was kind of true to my parents they would always take us to things that were a little outside of the box and so you know i was always sort of encountering new ideas through you know their eyes of like the things that were going on in new york city and things that they could take us to museums and my mom also danced um a lot as she was a, a young musician she did a lot of uh taking class at the Clark Center and, you know, worked with a lot of um, well-known dance teachers there. And so her decision to put me in the dance theater of Harlem was very conscious. She knew like exactly where I would get the greatest training and then subsequently Alvin Ailey. So yeah, I remember Petrushka. I remember- Was Petrushka you know, ABT? I don't even know. I can't remember exactly. I think so. I have a, a memory of like that theater. Um, I remember my like just being in the seat though and my reaction to it. Um, I saw a lot of city ballet growing up too. We, we would get uh, tickets from the Dance Theater of Harlem. They would give us free tickets, so we would go down there a lot. Um, and then you know things like Porgy and Bess, and you know, saw opera and all kinds of things. Ailey, Alvin Ailey, remember wow, seeing wonderful. seeing them before I got to the school. Um, lots of stuff. So when, when you were at uh, Dance Theater of Harlem, did you have an idol? I think uh, Christina Johnson was still in the company when I was just kind of starting there. And she was magnificent. Just so, I remember The Greatest. I don't know if you know that duet. Um, it was uh, to The Greatest Love of All, that song. And I just remember seeing that duet for the first time. And she was just so lush and, you know, very, um virtuosic but also very expressive which is something i think i've always valued in dance is that there's like a strong technique to it but also the expressivity um ty jimenez was another dancer that was in the company at the time or around the time that i was in the school um yeah i mean that was the beauty of going to dth and ALA was that there were a lot of the, the company was right there so you felt like you were already immersed in the professional world but those two mm -hmm. dancers come to mind um, and then my teachers, you know, you always kind of idolize your teachers. My first, one of my first main teachers, Meta Spaniardi, she actually was the person that really pushed me and she sent me to Central Pennsylvania Youth Ballet in the summers and like she really saw something in me and so, and the way she used language, you know, was really um, inspiring and why I also fell in love with the art form. And so she was a teacher that really kind of, um, made an impact early on uh, in my training. So it was mm -hmm. a mixture of both the performers and the faculty were very mm -hmm. um, influential. And then ALA too was like a, a feast of <laughs> amazing artists that I got to train under. But before you talk about Ailey, can you tell what, what prompted the switch from DTH to Ailey? I was about 14 and a half and loved ballet. You know, I still think of it as a first love, but I think, you know, my physique really wasn't right for ballet at that time. I think things have changed a lot. Um, I just felt like I needed to expand, like it was going to be a, a limited sphere for me. Um, and ultimately, my mom knew about Ailey and I was getting a little stuck. And she's like, why don't you try Ailey? And when I got there, it was equal parts ballet and the seminal modern, modern techniques. So I was almost getting as much maybe a little less point work, but, you know, I had ballet almost every day and then three days a week of Graham and Horton. So it was almost taking the rigor up in some ways. Um, and uh, in the summers, you know, I would get to do some of the ballet programs. I remember going to Central Pennsylvania in one of the summers of when I was at Ailey. So it ended up just amplifying my knowledge and I ended up falling in love with Graham <laughs> um, because, you know, the rigor in that is so special as well. And uh, right. I still use a lot of the exercises when I teach, you know, in a kind of deconstructive way. Um, so it was a really good move. And I ended up being at ALA for the rest of my high school years. And, and ultimately the, my peer group at ALA was amazing. I, I trained with Camille A. Brown and a lot of dancers that went on to be in Europe and so many amazing artists that are still in the field. They were, we were all in high school together. So it was a really special time to be there.
did you um, uh, did you go to what did you go to a regular public high school or private high school? What did you go to? So that's the other trajectory is that my parents, what a gift, you know, I'm thinking about what they gave me growing up. I went to a Montessori school growing up through eighth grade, the Bank Street School for Children, which is a very experimental um, space um, where children get to work in unique methodologies to learn about things like math and history. And I was there for eight years and then I did the application process for all the private schools in, in New York City and I got into Spence. Um, and uh, my parents were able to make it happen that I could, could be in private school for my whole education, which is, you know, really a gift and not easy, not easy, but they, they afforded me that. And, um, and were the I got a really co college, college level education in high school, it was like seminars. Yeah. And I did, um, did a lot of, uh, visual art in high school and, um, it was, it's a very special place. I'm actually their, uh, distinguished alumni this year, alumna this year. Ah, so I'm being, wonderful. And being honored this year. So just to be among the amazing women that have gone through Spence is right. It's unbelievable. And, and but were they supportive of your, uh, artistic career as well, you know, because there must oh, yeah. have been certain scheduling conflicts, et cetera. There were, yeah, as I started to excel in both programs, I was sort of always taking class with the older um, dancers. And so at some point I had to make my schedule at Spence kind of heavy in the morning so I could leave at about one or two, you know, to get over to ALA to take the higher level classes. But they were very, very understanding and if not, you know, really excited by it. Um, they actually have a really kind of nice arts program at Spence and there was a, a little dance company there that I choreographed in and started my first musings. And so, you know, having that opportunity there and then they would let me go over to take my, my classes. There've been a lot of dancers that have gone through Spence actually that have been at SAB and different places. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a perfect mixture. So the first piece of choreography you did was on the little company at Spence? Yes. Well, technically, the first piece I did was on myself auditioning for a summer program at the Fieldston School. Um, it's, you know, remembering all this is such a rich history because at the Fieldston School is where I met Linda Kent, who was with the Paul Taylor Company and Ailey. Sure. She was teaching, you know, as I'm doing now, you know, I'm teaching at all these places and you just never know. And so I had to make a solo to get into that program when I was in eighth grade still at Bank Street. So I sort of started there. I made my first solo in the living room um, to a jazz piece that my dad recommended. And um, then at Spence, I joined the dance company when I could because I was so busy with my classes outside of school. But I did some, you know, presented some solos. Um, I think my first group work was actually at Yale. So it's through these other kinds of trajectories outside of the um, conservatory environment that I got to really explore choreography. Wow. Just one aside. So when I danced for Bot Door, it was Linda that set Cloven Kingdom on us. Really? She yeah, set it on me too when I was in the school, you know, <laughs> in, in a summer workshop. But yeah, that's how I, I met her, you know, at Fieldston and then kept encountering her. She actually got me one of my first jobs out of school as a performer. Fantastic. Um, so we have she's a, a, a long she's a wonderful time. She's a wonderful lady. It's she a really small is. world. Yeah. Okay, so now you have to explain how you went from DTH <laughs> to Alvin Ailey to a history degree from Yale. Well, the same, sort of the same process. Like my parents opened up this field of opportunities and information. And, you know, I, I knew that I could apply with Ailey's support. I did all of the conservatory auditions and um, got into a couple of conservatories. Um, and then my parents said, why not? Why not try, you know, to, to see if you have opportunity in the Ivy League system or, you know, so we did the whole college tour up and down the East Coast. I knew I wanted to stay close to home. Um, and we just, you know, I just took it all in, you know, what, what would be the right, you know, space for me to develop and grow and evolve, you know, I love language. I love, you know, all these different aspects of um, scholastic enterprise. And so, you know, I, I did that tour. I had a college advisor that was also pushing me and, and he believed in me at Spence. And I ended up getting into quite a few schools. And um, ultimately I ended up having three. And uh, one of them was SUNY Purchase, uh, which is an amazing conservatory. And, um, 
and then Yale was on that list too. And I just, I felt something, you know, it's hard to know when you're 18 years old, really <laughs> what that right direction is, but I just trusted my gut and it, it ended up being revelatory um, because it sort of took me out of this New York space and out of this sort of dance scene of New York. And I had to figure out how dance was gonna be a part of my life in a liberal arts environment. But that's sort of where the seeds of Sidra Bell Dance New York sort of started because I was working with Yale. I founded an organization on campus called Alliance for Dance at Yale College that hosted workshops and events and performances. And I was in a small troupe there called Yale Dancers, all outside of our academic requirements. And um, there was this sort of seed of an idea around community and performance that built up there. And a lot of my friends that I graduated were, with were saying, you should really keep going. What did that even mean, you know, at that time? How could we know, you know, at age 22, you know, like what would be in front of us? But it was really that encouragement from that experience of working within community outside of a program with dance and the language of dance that led me to found the nonprofit right mm. in 2001 when I graduated. So it sounds like you were uh, just as involved in dance, even though you were taking your history degree at Yale. Even, yeah, even more so somehow, because I really had to search and figure it out. And when I founded the Alliance for Dance at Yale, we hosted an annual symposia on dance. And I had to do a lot of research, you know, who could I, who could I bring up to school to inform and share? And uh, Jacqueline Buglisi, another, amazing teacher of mine. I remember meeting with her between my freshman and sophomore year saying, how can I get this going? And she gave me all these amazing contacts of Carmen DeLavalot and the editor of Dance Magazine and Gus Solomons Jr. And they all came, you know, I, she helped me kind of start that initiative up and she came too. She came with her troupe to perform. So it really taught me a lot about um, self enterprise um, and keeping keeping the connection of dance with not, not only in the studio, but relationship building. Um, and so it was a very important step for me, um, thinking about how to forge new paths. Um, I also was very, very shy growing up. So this was like a huge thing for me to even think about <laughs> starting an organization and, and ultimately becoming an educator myself. Um, so there, there are a lot of different people along the way that helped me think about dance in constructive ways and outside of institution you know institutional frameworks and how to like create my own my own ideas how so wonderful to credit yeah <laughs> how wonderful so tell me so now when you yourself go to hire dancers do they come from a contemporary or ballet backgrounds or both they're from all over the place. I mean, I've been making work now in New York City for 20 years. So we just celebrated our 20 year anniversary. December 8th, 2001 was the first show that I produced with my family. We had live music and lots of different components, but it happened in Harlem, 2001. So this has been 20 years of collaborating with dance artists, um, really from all over the world. A lot of them come from training you know, and I think training is wide because I've had people that are more focused in the ballet language, but I've also worked with people that pop and lock and crump and, but also went through training programs at some point. So I think the common denominator is that they've all encountered training, whether it's later or earlier, um, it's sort of dependent on the dancers. Right now, the company is made up of a really eclectic mix of, of dancers. Um, I actually have one dancer right now from Bennington College um, and they were working a lot with somatics and you know also with the language of ballet from when they were at lines but now more vested in like somatic language I have some that are choreographers some that have danced in ballet companies um, it's really it's really a mixture over the years um, and all from all over the world I've had uh, dancers from Korea and Italy and um, that's very exciting. South Africa, yeah. Poland. Yeah. It's so it, exciting I, to have such big, an international group. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's very exciting. And I try to do as much as I can to foster that. Um, you know, we take each artist that we take on is really like taking on an artist. Um, it's an, it's a smaller troupe, 
especially now, you know, as we became more established, it sort of scaled down to five or six dancers every season. And one of the goals is to really foster their growth. Um, so if they're coming right out of a school, you know, they sort of have to learn how to um, work within the performance world in a different way than when they were in school. So I do a lot of teaching and, and work with them and dialogue um, to sort of pull their technique out to that next space of performance, live performance. Mm, wonderful. So then in, in 2019, of course, you were engaged by New York City Ballet to mm -hmm. choreograph for the company, the first Black female choreographer to be so invited. What did that feel like? Oh, it's surreal. I've had a few moments like this in life, you know, more than one person should have, but it was unexpected for sure. You know, um, you go through a lot of different arcs as a creator and, you know, at the point when I was invited, I was just kind of settled into a rhythm, not really thinking a lot about, you know, ambition or desire or things that I wanted to do. I was just sort of in a rhythm, you know, you sort of get into your creative zone, but all of a sudden, I got a, a call from my mentor, Alexandra Wells, who's the director of Springboard Dance Montreal and an amazing, has made an amazing career as a ballet dancer herself. And she's like, Wendy Whalen wants to come watch you work. <laughs> and I was like, really? You know, it was just came out of nowhere sort of for me at that point, not thinking about the future really. And she came and she actually watched me teaching. I have an improvisational practice and she came and watched me in that setting, which was really beautiful actually, because um, that's that practice is really where I feel most at home as an artist, like teaching and being amongst students. And so she just sat quietly in the corner. And again, I didn't know what what the sort of project was that she was thinking about, but just a couple of days later, she emailed me and said, do you want to be a part of the fashion gala? Which was thrilling because I've always, as a kind of part of my arc has been really leaning into the design and, you know, ideas around, you know, the way the body can work within design and costumes. And so I couldn't believe it, actually, you know, it's one thing to be commissioned, but then to be commissioned for the fashion gala was unreal. So, you know, it, it just felt like a beautiful surprise, you know. Did it feel that, weighty as well? Did it feel like a responsibility? Not like in that moment. Had. No, not in that moment. I think it was it was really early on, you know, it was like a year out. I think when I started to feel the weight was when I sat in what was the state theater. I know it is a state theater from growing up in New York, but I asked Wendy, I said, can I bring my parents? We went to go see dances at a gathering just to see the dancers and to, you know, get to know what was ahead. And just sitting in that theater, maybe like 20 years you know, from when maybe I sat in it as a young adult, um, that felt surreal. I was like, I can't believe my work is gonna be on this huge, beautiful stage. <laughs> and then like all the possibilities start ringing in your head, like, well, what scale should it be? And you know, what, but you can't really anticipate till you get in the studio that first day with the dancers. So, but that that moment, just seeing them, them perform, this was back in like December, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really far out, but that was when the weight of everything and you know really kind of set in. I was like, this is really happening. And I can't believe that I'm here. And not only here, but I get to be here with my parents who have worked so hard to allow me to explore and, and be a part of the world of art. And now they get to see this kind of culminating moment. It was really very special. Oh, how wonderful. Well, let's have a look of a little little piece of it, okay? Let me uh, bring it up.
Wow, that's so wonderful. Tell me, Sidra, who's, uh, I assume part of it was necessitated by the pandemic that it was placed out on the plaza, mm -hmm. but did you have a good deal of input about where it was placed on the plaza? So the, that project was in response to, you know, all the closures that were happening at the middle of 2020. And at that point I, I thought, 2021 is, you know, the next time I'll be encountering New York City Ballet, but it was another beautiful surprise when Wendy called and asked me if I wanted to do a digital piece. And there were parameters around how it could happen because we were right smack in the middle of the pandemic, uh, October, September, October of 2020. So I knew I was going to be rehearsing on Zoom and that I had to really work with the framework of fragmentation having the dancers in different isolated cells on the on the screen. I uh, spent a lot of time working on my home studio, you know, making sure that I could do the process just as I would as if I was there with them. And I spent about four hours a day with them on Zoom and um, kind of it all unfolded as a sort of screen piece. And then working with the cinematographer Ezra Hurwitz, we collaborated on site and we basically ran around the plaza taking photos of different landscapes and planes. I knew that planes in space would be a really important visual because my work really kind of reacts and responds to planes in space. So it was going to be a really interesting counterposition. And with Ezra Hurwitz, we just created this kind of timeline of the piece. And um, yes, it was necessitated by the pandemic, but it became this kind of opportunity to see Lincoln Center in this whole kind of extreme and augmented way and uh the film day of filming was really exciting because you know there was a lot of rigging and um a pretty big team you know made that film happen so it was it was just exciting to kind of reimagine how this work could be taken within a timeline but also out of time in some ways mm -hmm. uh, those dancers looked so beautiful did you feel as a whole the city ballet dancers understood you they got you or did it was, was really it something great. that you had to work on? What was great is that those four dancers in this first digital piece, they actually were had, had been selected like maybe six months before for the stage piece. And then when everything um, changed, I knew that I wanted to pull from that cast because I had already done a lot of work looking at them in the studio and kind of seeing my work really requires a kind of physical intelligence as, as much as the work references ballet forms and seminal forms. There's a different kind of inhabitation of the spine. And so luckily I'd been able to look at those dancers a few months before. And then when we came, you know, onto the Zoom platform, I was able to to know them in some ways, but then also to bring my uh, language and pedagogies to the process enough that when we came to the site, you know, there was an understanding, a, a rich understanding. It was really great going from Zoom to we did one-on-ones in the studio and getting to really coach each individual dancer in the work. It was uh, actually really intimate. Um, and so I think that's where you see the richness coming out is really almost was like a one-on-one -on -one process with each of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or one-on-two. So, one -on <laughs> so that, that clip that we just saw was not really what was intended for the fashion gala. That was something separate? I, I thought of it as a totally separate project because I knew that then the fashion gala was going to be another year in advance. And there was a, there were other conversations totally separate, you know, working with Mark Happel, the director of costumes at, at City Ballet, that we had been working also for months in advance on envisioning what that stage piece was like. So I sort of compartmentalized the digital project as something separate and unique. And then I knew I was going to dive right back into the fashion gala once we were able to and almost capitalize on all the time we had to build up to it and, and go even further into it. So it was it was a hard, hard year during the pandemic, but I probably couldn't have been luckier as a creator. I had a lot of exciting collaborations that took place and even more time to ruminate on what that stage piece would look like. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've spoken uh, in other interviews about being a black woman in the traditional white space of ballet as I'm using your words, against all odds. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, how have you bumped up against that? And what have you needed to adjust in any way? I think just working in the in the form itself, you know, I think there are traditions um, that have lived on for many years in the ballet uh, form. And it's interesting as a contemporary maker that uses ballet language, you know, there's a lot of line and articulation in my work. It really does call upon all those things. But then thematically, there's a lot that I, I push against and kind of I've been known to be a little bit of a disruptor. So that alone is something that I think it's identifiable as something that looks like it comes from the ballet tradition, but there thematically are there things that are just very different um, around um, the body, you know, around gender, around um, the way the, the ensemble moves together. So I think in that way, I've always been sort of a disruptor. And so um, I feel like just, I slipped more into that somehow as, and being the first black woman to make a work on the company felt very much in line with my own personal legacy of coming from dance theater Harlem, of being the product of an interracial family and all the traditions that we've broke as a family. <laughs> um, you know, my upbringing, you know, as a black woman, mixed heritage um, woman has always been kind of an anomaly. And so I just feel like I slipped more into that and just sort of, there's something very uh, amazing and enjoyable and and surprising about having that be me in some ways. <laughs> it's like, I knew, you know, when I got the commission, I was like, I think I might be the first, you know, <laughs> but then to really feel that and the weight of that, and then to, to be able to carry legacies and traditions from my teachers, and there's just so much circularity and importance in it. And also then for my students, um, there's a lot of responsibility in that, like even more of a responsibility as a teacher now, I think, um, to carry the tradition and to give them the tools. And those things have always been important for me. So it just felt like this this moment was for everyone. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I've had students say, and I've said this in other interviews, I've had students say how much it means to them that they can see themselves in me. Um, that the representation is important. And so I just try to walk the walk and try to, to really be present in every experience and to, to also make mistakes, you know, to be a human. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, to be really I, in, I, the, in the process. Right. But so, you know, uh, the summer of 2020 was a significant summer with Black Lives Matter and George Floyd. And how did that affect your work? Uh, I mean, it affected everyone sort of personally, but did it also affect your work? I think uh, my work somehow always deals with like pain, <laughs> um, especially the work I deal with in sort of my more dramatic theatrical works. And I felt something spiritually was tearing me apart that summer um, and for everyone and um, and still like there's something I feel there's a sort of like tearing apart um, and so a lot of I guess the way that I was affected was by digging more into kind of personal humanity and um, feeling like there was I could tap into more empathy and more listening um, I think a lot of the work has changed for me in the way that I work around community and was already changing a lot kind of at this phase of my career. But the way that I think about my role in community has, I would say in the last five, six years actually has shifted a lot. And so just that pause and then all the, the strife and still, you know, we're still kind of doing this. And so I've just really tried to plug into where I'm like, how I could, be more of a leader and take more responsibility and how I could work within community. Um, heal, healing has become very important in my work, um, particularly around spiritual strife, 
Um, and so a lot of the like journeys I take in my movement, and both when I'm making work and also kind of guiding um, has a lot to do with spiritual journeying and ultimately reconciling those things bit by bit, but it's always <laughs> another journey. Um, well, I mean, so, so, some yeah. of your uh, some of your older work, anyway, is, seemed like it it uh, had a very theatrical side, and I mean that in the very best way. And it, some of it is even macabre a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> where where, do, where does that come from? You know, I was asking that question earlier. <laughs> uh, my, my mom and I have a lot of artistic conversations, and I've been doing a lot of poetry lately. Poetic. I've been thinking more about taking my language of dance into the written form more. So I've been doing a lot of listening to old memos and old writings and sort of saying, where does that come from, you know, out loud to her. And I think a lot of it comes from the things that I see um, around human folly, <laughs> you know, toil, um, literature, dreams, like it all sort of comes together for me in this very hyper real dreamy space, um, things I've seen, read, experienced. Um, well, so when you, when you begin a work, <laughs> does it start off with an idea of an atmosphere or a story? I think atmosphere is always there via like a musical channel. There's always music playing in the studio, it's like a sort of large, library of things playing. Um, I always have my notebook next to me, writing po poems. Um, the dancers become very influential where they are in their lives. And that's a lot of, I think, what's changing for me too, is that I'm working with a new generation of dancers who are experiencing the world in a totally different way than I did. And so reacting and responding to that is a lot of the process. Um, and the work just, it truly is collaborative in that sense that it's like the sum of parts that are in the studio, trying not to come in and forecasting too much, but really working with the body and creating material that then maybe tells a story of the moment. Um, I think in those early works, I was dealing a lot with uh, the female body, the male gaze. There was always like a politic going on there around that. And um a lot of that kind of macabre violence almost comes from this sort of bucking up against the system, but more from a female lens. Mm -hmm. um, and then those works then transformed over the years. Like then they were, some of those roles were taken on by male identifying bodies. And so they just kept transforming. And actually what we're working on right now as a company is a repertory show. So it's really interesting to see the work through these you know, pretty new, you know, interpreters. So. I think the theater is in the body. I've said that before, but the body is a theater of there's so much, such a wealth of memory and dreams and perceptions and reactions. And mm. that's why I love improv because that's where I kind of source a lot of that information and, and feel, mm. um, it almost feels like sensing work more than choreographing. Mm. Mm. So let me, let me go. Uh, I want to share a clip of a beautiful beast and this would have been from uh, 2010.
got a new star now and it goes like this I took my hand out of my pocket up came a face that it was headline news one more abuse I've got to tell it with a fist and it goes like this how 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 <laughs> Wow. Another (laughs) one. I have to hear about this. (laughs) That was such a gem of a show. You know, it was, that was actually my first full length piece in New York. I'd been doing since 2001 festivals and creating these smaller works for ensemble. And somehow I created the like core where you see the women sort of doing this movement, that section, we created that for a festival. And then someone ultimately saw it from the duo theater in the East fourth block arts district in New York. And they were like, this needs to be an evening show. (laughs) And um, it was a huge opportunity was commission fees, which I hadn't ever gotten before for the company. Like, okay, this is going to be a show. And uh, it really was a product of this really zany group of dancers that I was working with at the time. And mostly women, as I was saying, dealing with the male gaze and, I thought of this idea of beautiful beasts as sort of looking at the um, iconography of beasts like horses or beasts of burden, and then using that to kind of let imagery explode from there. And it ended up being this mixture of, you know, all these sort of um, symbols, you know, you have the clown, um, you have these sort of burlesque figures and, dolls and all these sort of interesting images and ultimately we spent maybe eight months on the on the project working you know working small sections of it there were even sections of it that were developed in street performances that we just tried out um, as pop-up performances it was really a special time in new york too because there was a little less red tape and restriction around doing site-specific work Um, so we were ended up developing in really unique kinds of performance experiences that then culminated in Beautiful Beasts um, at the Duo Theater. And at that theater, I think it has a history with Andy Warhol and it's a really strange space with murals and you know angels on the wall and uh-huh. gilded frames. And it, it was so pretty, pretty fit, site specific. It fit right in. Yeah, and there were 18 dancers in the piece. So wow. a very wow. small little dressing room and I remember they, <laughs> we had several eyelash changes and, you know, <laughs> multiple, multiple head pieces and things, uh-huh. but that's New York, you know, that's the beauty of New York, right. that, particularly at that time, there was like this explosion of like, it felt like anything was possible. And do you, um, do you enjoy that form of an evening length work or do you prefer, let's say a program of several smaller works? Well, that, that set off almost a decade of then making evening length works. Um, after that experience, I, I put a lot of my energy around consolidating energy and time and, and funds to put on an evening length work every year and creating relationships with spaces that would support that. And so for several years, we did work at Baruch Performing Arts Center and the community college. And we would spend again, eight, nine months building up to a June show and uh, with scenography and you know I have a resident lighting designer I've worked with that long and so Beautiful Beast was a catalyst for this sort of decade of of making evening length works. Right now I'm redoing a lot of revisiting of of seminal pieces of those works so we're putting together a show right now that will tour to Cincinnati in March which is an evening length work but kind of a mixture of all those really fun works from the past. So So, there's something about being in an audience and just being there for an hour, you know, and not having to think about anything else, just dropping in, no intermission, immerse, immersive. But I'm always curious about as a, as a creator, when you're putting it together, is there a moment where you go, Oh my God, I still have another 20 minutes to go. The dancers were always, will always joke with me or maybe I joke with myself. There's a point maybe six months into the process where I'm like, we have no material. (laughs) I feel like (laughs) nothing makes sense. Nothing works. It's all sort of a sham and not going to really, it doesn't, won't read, you know, it's, there have been moments where I feel like, you know, this just won't hold together, but that's the fun of it is like then strategizing and figuring out, okay, what, what do we need? What more, 
do we need? Is it about the design? Is it about um, oh my God, that's the fun of it. Yeah. That's the fun of it. It sounds like the agony of it to me. There's such challenge in it. Well, that's what makes me a maker is I love the challenges. Like without the challenge is really nothing to stand on. So it's nice to have those moments with your collaborators where you're really trying to dig into the puzzle, but that's the exciting piece mm -hmm. of it. But so what's your technique for yourself when you feel like, oh, we don't have the material, it's not going to put together. What's the technique you use to like say, okay. <laughs> Every work is different. Um, there have been works where I, I know for sure the dancers don't know what they're about to do on stage always. That sort of is rooted, I think, in the improvisational nature of my process is that a lot of the, the process and the training for months on end is actually to ultimately not know what's going to happen somehow. So I think in my particular world, there is a bit of digging into the unknown that's important as a performer. It's obviously a skill, like to be able to hold space and not know what to do with that space is something I think my dancers have a unique kind of uh, skill at. Um, but yeah, there are other strategies. When you go on stage too, there are so many different things that emerge. You know, I may leave space open for something to happen with light that I don't know will happen to have that be a possibility. Like we're, we're marking time because something really interesting is gonna happen here with the design world or something with the costuming. You know, maybe there's something with the projection element. And so there's a lot that gets solved in the technical process too that I think you can't over choreograph because mm. it's not leaving enough room for those other elements to come into it. So right. I, I like a loose skeleton. Um, I tend to get a lot of the big material out there in the beginning. Um, so there's a lot of work with phrases in the first months of the process and really having enough physical content so I'm not ever lost at the end in that regard. Mm. So, uh, so now you're rehearsing again in person, yeah? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's anything that came out of having to pivot towards a virtual platform in terms of choreographing, in terms of performing that will stay once this pandemic is completely over with? Is there something that we learned and gained? I think that there's more attention and care in the studio now. It's something I've always valued in the process is that respect is kind of the bottom line. But now there's definitely more attention and care when we enter the studio, there are a lot more things to take care of. And I noticed with my dancers, the sensitivity is sort of built up quite a bit. And, you know, when we when we go to make contact or when we go to have a kind of moment in dialogue with each other, there's a lot more thought and attention to how we think about language and touch. And so I do notice that sensitivity having built up. Um, there's obviously the logistical components that also become useful in terms of um, like when I'm away, I have a piece going up a Boulder Ballet this week and I've been able to rehearse them while I haven't been there. Um, so being able to drop in and be in Boulder <laughs> and coach the dancers a little bit, not the same as being there, but at least touch base with them and, and sort of see where the piece is at. So that when I go back this week for tech, you know, there's an underscoring of knowledge that's sustained. Um, Honestly, it's something I've always leaned into because I've always done international collaboration. So if I'm working with a band in Sweden, I actually used Zoom several years ago to meet with them and keep material going and brainstorm ideas. And so for me, it's always felt really relevant to have a virtual system going or getting material back to my company dancers when I'm away. Mm -hmm. So it, it feels like leaning more into that accessibility that we all need at times. Right. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like for you, Zoom and the virtual platforms are more about uh, like a, a, a technical aspect or some, something for another tool for communicating and moving the project forward. Absolutely. Yeah. There's there's something about having several different modalities in place. I even have Google Docs going like you know, if I have an idea that's burgeoning and I need to like sort of keep track of that with the dancers or like Google Docs of dramaturgy ideas or Google Docs of costume trajectories. And there's so many different documents that they have access to videos, you know, things that they can access when we can't be in real space together that they can still do the work. Um, 
And so I think that comes from just maybe my scholastic background, just having a lot of different modes in place and, and, and ways to empower the artists to have access to information um, and archiving, you know, it's also system archiving um, ideas as well. So I've, I've just leaned into it. I've, I've done a lot of work over the past two years with universities virtually um, and also a lot of mentoring. So it's been a nice way to connect with students as well and, and to, um, you know, keep information going. I have a, a mentoring meeting right after this talk, actually. With someone, really? from, someone from CalArts doing their MFA project. So. Uh -huh. so I actually do mentoring as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think the most important thing is to, to communicate to a mentee? Well, I think mentoring is cir circular. I have ment mentors still um, that I really trust and rely on. Um, I think for me, growing into mentorship because it's something I've always done, but maybe more formally in the past five years is just opening up the sphere of questions. You know, I think meeting that artist, dancer, and maker, because I also do it with performers to, you know, coaching work and just seeing how I can best fill up space or create more articulation around their ideas without superimposing my own values, you know. That's a tough thing to do, isn't it? Very tough. <laughs> it's very tough, but I think, you know, I think mentoring is for me, I've been an extension also of teaching, but whereas teaching is sort of my method, I think with mentoring, I'm trying to get that artist to better articulate what they want and desire and how best strategies to get there, help them with strategies to get there. So each mentorship is really unique too. There's no blueprint to mentoring. And um, what I love about mentoring is that it can happen on a street corner, you know, it can happen on the phone, it can happen anywhere. It's it's really a relationship building and it can happen over coffee, you know. Mentoring maybe isn't even always verbally understood as being mentoring, it's just friendship, you know, a kind of friendship, extended relationship building. That's valuable. I'm gonna keep that for my mentees. <laughs> I, like, I like that. I like that. So you said that sometimes when you perform in different cities, you're really engaging with the community at large. Mm -hmm. Have there ever been any cities where you've maybe found that difficult? Or, where, or I should maybe put it, were there other cities that were easier than others? And why? Yeah. Well, I love traveling, first of all. I love traveling around the country, um, this country. And I, I love traveling internationally too, but I think there's something like the, the texture of my work really shifts from state to state. Um, having spent a lot of time, obviously on the East Coast and the West Coast, which feel like art centers, but then also in the Midwest and the Pacific Northwest and areas like that. Um, for me, the beauty of that is just in the tempo, like the tempo shifts for me a lot. And so I find more stillness and almost more availability when I'm away from New York City because there's just literally more space. <laughs> um, so whereas that would be seen maybe as difficult to not have as much stimulus um, or stimuli, it feels like I actually gain more insight into areas of my work that are more humane or more interesting or or weird or strange um, because I'm spending a lot of time alone. I just recently spent uh, several weeks in Oklahoma um, and a lot of time just walking and, and you can imagine just it's planes and it's, you know, there's just a lot of negative space. So I find that that's very informative, not difficult, but just it's more information. Um, and it really does affect the texture of my work. When I come back to New York, I find more texture and I almost long for those places again. <laughs> like I almost miss being in those space. I just came from Indiana last week too. Like there's just something very um, sort of wide about how my imagination works when I'm away from New York. Similarly in the, on the West Coast, but different um, Pacific Northwest, obviously the beauty of those places. Um, so it's all fascinating to me. Pittsburgh is another place I've spent a lot of time in and it has that has a very industrial feel also very empty in spots and 
almost, you know, there are spaces in that city that feel like ruins, you know, there's like a ruination to it, but that's interesting, not challenging, interesting, cap mm -hmm. like com compelling. So that's the way I think of, of different places. Obviously with audiences, you know, that varies a lot. You know, when you're in the South, you're encountering a different kind of relationship to the body and dance. So that's been an interesting conversation to have in places like New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Texas even, like just the relationship to the body is very different. So you're, I think for the dancers, that can be interesting. How Maybe so? Just... How so? Different in what way? Um, I think areas around um, what feels like performance even, you know, coming from New York, we kind of take for granted that as New Yorkers, we have access to a, lot, a spectrum of art and in other places, they're usually just getting like main touring shows. Um, so when we go as a smaller company, boutique experimental, you know, that's a big risk for presenters to take um, because their audiences tend to be less exposed to areas around the body that feel difficult or strange. So that's one of the, the beautiful things though, is having these encounters with audiences and, and them saying, well, what was that? What really was that? <laughs> you know, where in New York, you don't get that question a lot because so there's so much going on, but when you're right. elsewhere, it actually is a gift to be in those kinds of performing experiences because you get to have a real conversation and kind of think about, well, what is the context of this really in this space, not just in the theater, but in this city, in this state? So I've, I've really enjoyed that part of it. And then with that, there come outreach opportunities. And as a company we do, because education is such a huge part of what we do, I've done work with you know, community spaces on the road, even uh, wow. working in correctional facilities and things like that. So um, it's wow. something I, I think of more as a gift than a challenge. I, you know, this hour has flown by, Sidra. It's unbelievable. So I have only one one question I'm going to ask and one question that was in the chat. Um, so you've been making work since you were 22 years old. When you go back and look at your work from 22 years old, what do you want to say to yourself? Well, part of it is like, was that me? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> but I still see myself in it. Um, I spent a lot of time in the summer of 2020 with my dad actually, cause he does a lot of digital archiving in our studio. And it's like, did I really do that? Like, I can't even, you know, it almost was like scrubbed from memory, but then I look back and I was like, almost nostalgic and, and sad in a way. Like there was so much, I missed that moment where there was so much possibility ahead of me. Um, so and I'm getting emotional, but <laughs> it was a really beautiful time. Oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> I was. mean, so so many artists look back and go, oh my God, why did I do that? <laughs> you know, and it's wonderful no, like, to hear that the, you know, you feel the you feel me. a warmth. Yeah, you feel warmth I do. I from it. The and there's there's so much possibility. And there's still so much possibility, but it was such a special time within family and you know being encouraged and they're like skies was the limit. And I think that way still, but it's, it's different now. It has a different skew to it. So it's more of a nostalgia. <laughs> right, right, right. But so is there anything you haven't done yet that you would like to? <laughs> well, I, I've been thinking a lot about this too. And um, people say that to me all the time, like, don't you want to be here and there? But I feel so satisfied in what I've done because I've done it on my own terms. And that can be a difficult road to travel, but it's it's actually amazing because I feel so free now. I don't mm -hmm. long I don't long for a lot because I feel like anything that I wanted I've made happen um, in my own way, you know, and those are successes that are very different. Of course, you know, there are places I'd love to travel to and and companies I'd love to work with and venues I'd love to be presented in. But Ultimately, I feel like I've done it. It's a Frank Sinatra. I don't know, <laughs> but like I did it my way. You know, it really and is. And so that. you did. How wonderful yeah. to be able to say that. How know, wonderful. It's, it's, but I still strive. You know, every day when I go in the studio, it still feels like I was just in the studio today with two of my dancers. It's like 
there's still this picking at and curiosity and like, well, I don't know, and what is it gonna be? And so that that game of being in process with people never gets old. And mm-hmm. so there's still that sense of like boundless opportunities within, if you're present, if you stay present, there's just constant opportunity and inspiration. So that's kind of what roots me in staying in the practice. That's wonderful. So there was one question in the chat and it was, did the uh, New York City Ballet Gala work utilize improv or dancer contribution as well? Yes, it did. I, I generated a lot of the movement material, which is what I normally do within my body. But ultimately, it's always a conversation with the dancers, like, try this, try that, especially with the coupling duets. Um, there was one male duet that was my assistant Gilbert Small and I put together a sketch of it. And then we came back in the studio and worked with it with the two dancers, but we were sort of trying out the physics of the body and what could they do. And, you know, certain lifts like pas de poisson. I haven't <laughs> ever used one of those in a piece, but they were sort of saying, why not this idea? You know, so there was a lot of back and forth in that way. I think the base material comes from me, but then all these sort of variations and ideas and, and ultimately the interpretation on stage every night was very different. My favorite image in the whole piece is the end, which almost feels like a a mural. So you have several bodies in space and they're sort of doing their own thing in their own worlds. And it it feels very improvisational, the ending. It almost feels raw at the end. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Sidra, this hour flew by and I wanna, I can't thank you enough for coming and sharing and being so open and what you've had to say, it's really, Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Yes. So I will say good night to you as I'm going to make a few more uh, comments to our audience. So good night to you, Sitter, and thank you again. Good night. Good night. So thank you all for tuning in tonight. If you've enjoyed this interview, please consider donating at stepsbeyond.org. Everyone, we could really use your help so that we can continue to bring you this interview series in our performance lab. So please do consider donating. After a hiatus of over two years, we're resuming our performance lab in person this spring. We're thrilled to be presenting new and emergent choreographers live in our studio theater to an audience eager to see the next new talents on the horizon. Lab application deadline is now March 28th, so there's still time for any of you choreographers out there to put uh, an a application in. And choreographers and interested in audience members can visit our website for full information. And again, please help us out by donating so we can continue to bring this exciting program. Please join us again on March 20th when I'll be interviewing Michaela Marino Learman a jazz tap master about to make her debut at the Joyce Theater. Come back and hear about this unique dancer's journey. Once again, thank you, Sidra, and thank you to all of you. Good night, all.